Morning, everybody. So, why well, we got that words on the screen on a Sunday morning? Well, let's talk. How many of you just take a look at a yard and need some work and think, yes, nature lesson. We go out, we dig in with joy and relish, we're just getting out the weeds. Everybody, right? Well, some of us. <laughs> Not everybody. <laughs> when I was younger, I tried to avoid yard work like the plague. But after living with that one for a while, I kind of really, really miss it. And it's a tiny yard. I really like having some greenery. And I still don't relish yard work. But I like what the yard looks like afterwards. And that's this weekend. I got out and I did some yard work. And after letting go for a little bit too long, and I pulled a whole compost bin of stuff, weeds from just one part of the yard. And this is not a big yard. It's a little bitty yard, mind you. And I was thinking, we don't even have that many plants in that yard. Where'd this come from? But sure enough, the bin was full at the end of the day. Now, why are we talking about this? Why do we have this crazy title, Plant Wars, up on the screen? Well, I've got a hypothesis. I believe we can look at nature and learn a whole lot. This last weekend, I think I came across something that, that kind of helped me understand things a little bit better. Have you ever considered how plants wage war against one another? And that's kind of weird, right? But they do. You just don't realize it. It's actually really interesting. I came across this one bush. It was a brighter green and lusher in foliage than all the rest of the bushes around it. And I thought, wow, that plant must be doing really well. I'm not a master gardener, but I know if you've got a bush and it, it looks green, looks lively, it's probably doing pretty right, pretty good, right? However, I was actually deceived. I thought this was going to be the one plant I could skip over as it looked good from afar off. But that wasn't the case. On closer inspection, I noticed the green leaves were a bit smaller than what I expected. They were too close. There's too many. This bush doesn't have that many leaves, not this close together. So I looked close to the bush and I noticed that it was wrapped up in a vine. And that vine, well, actually looked kind of pretty, was actually killing the bush. Left alone, that bush would have died, and that vine was nothing left to feed on, and it had been dead too. So, this, instead of this nice greenery, I would have been cut down to dead mess if it had been left too long. I'm not sure how that vine got in there, but it had come up the back of the bush and grew it up, wrapping up the bush, even to the point where the different branches were bound up together. Now, some branches, in some ways, the, the bush was literally tied up. Some branches had to have the vine cut off to separate each other. The vine was hugging it to death. Now, if you've heard my message about rocks, I like nature. The vine was killing the bush, and I had to work in the hot sun to get all this done, and yet I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah, I'm kind of strange. I learned some things in that bush all wrapped up in a vine. First off, always double-check things. Appearances can be deceiving. From a distance, the bush looked pretty healthy, it wasn't a close inspection. It turned out to be in trouble. But what I thought was most interesting was how the vine attacked. Now, it clearly was an attack. Nearly completely successful, too, as the bush may not have lasted much longer if it had been left just on its own. Those plants were in a life and death struggle. However, there's no body blows. There's no guns blaring. There's no drop kicks to the head. No, no threats. Nothing we think of as an, a normal attack with humans, right? And I thought this was pretty interesting. One plant nearly killed another plant without any of those overtly violent acts. The vine attacked slowly. It started out harmlessly, reaching up to the bush, looked good while doing it, and it was quite successful. Have you ever had something like that happen to you? Ever been attacked slowly, effectively, not realizing it was already happening. There's lots of examples of this doing people to do other people. But how about a sample that's pretty, pretty common to a lot of folks? How many of us like food? I do. <laughs> I like it a lot, probably too much. Have you ever thought about what happens when you eat too much food? Once, twice, not a big deal. You may not even realize it much at all. However, over time, it catches up with us. Little bit by little bit, those pounds add up. <laughs> How about this? You ever caught yourself with a bad habit? 
something that you just don't really want to do, but you kind of end up doing it? But how did it get to be a habit? Little bit by little bit, over time. Solomon, talking about a lesson from an overgrown field, noted how I got that way. If you would, turn to Proverbs 24, 32 and 33. Proverbs 24, 32 and 33. Get in verse 32. When I saw it, I considered it well. I looked on it and received instruction. A little sleep, a little more slumber, a little fold of the hands to rest. Just one, one time. Okay, maybe another, one more time. Before we know it, the pounds add up. The hard to take off, the bad habits really get hard to break and replace with good habits. They build. That vine, when it started crawling up that bush, it didn't just blow up and cover the whole bush immediately. It started out slow. It crept up the back. It wasn't easy to see. It wrapped up one branch, then another, then a few more together, and some more. And it didn't take terribly long, but it wasn't an overnight occurrence. Now let's turn to Ephesians for a moment and start to put all this together. Ephesians 6, 10-12. Ephesians 6, 10-12. Again in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, I thought that verse was kind of weird when I first read it. I'm up here. I'm not wearing any armor that I can tell of. Got a shirt and pants on here. Done very good when not ready for war. And that I know of, I'm not being attacked right now. So what does this talk about wrestling? Why are they talking about that? It sounds violent, visceral. But I'm not engaged in any violent or visceral acts right now. I'm standing here with the family of God. This verse doesn't seem quite right at first. What about that bush? It was standing there in the warm California sunlight, but it was wrestling a vine to death, and it was losing. And it clicked for me. Our struggles with sin are not generally physical and in our faces. They're subtle. They creep up on us. They're often effective if we aren't taking care of ourselves. Caught early, that vine would have been a quick pluck out of the ground. But caught late, and it was an ordeal to get it extracted from it. Same way with sin. Guarding our hearts early on, catching things before it comes too late, it's much easier. Catching them later on becomes much, much harder. In architecture, there's a saying. You can use an eraser on the drafting table or a sledgehammer on the construction site. It's very true, right? <laughs> it's much easier to start early as they used to say on uh, Mayberry, nip it in the bud, nip it in the bud. <laughs> but, however, since that vine had not been caught early, it was in a wrestling match to the death, right? It was there. Has anybody ever seen this type of vine? Yeah. This is called kudzu, the vine that ate the sow. <laughs> If we could see sin as an object, this is what it looked like when we're losing. It's everywhere. It's all over us, and we're just consumed with it. We get all tied up. It's all over us, and it's killing us. But this is the end state. This is right at the end. Let's go back to how it started. Study the battle. See what we can learn from it. See how we can win that fight. First off, the vine is started up the back. In the dark shade, no one can notice. Yeah, it snuck over like a ninja. If that vine was 10 feet tall and rushing out like a freight train, if that bush could move, it'd jump. It'd get out of the way. So would we if we saw it coming, right? But life doesn't happen like that. It comes at you a little bit, a little bit, gradually. And let's look how Jesus describes this. Let's turn to Matthew 5. Matthew 5, 
21 through 24. This is from the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, starting in verse 21. You've heard that I said of those of old, you should not murder. Whoever murders will be a danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, basically we call him dummy, shall be in danger of the council. Whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come offer your gift. How did you end up hurting that guy? Well, I was mad at him. Anger can eat a person up, right? That other person's off living their life, doing their thing. We're fuming and boiling, and it's just eating us up, and we just want to get back and just get to him, right? You think to yourself, oh, if I just had a chance to hit him, I could do good again. Your thoughts lead to actions. It's lead to consequences. Whatever you keep thinking about, you eventually do. If you keep running through your head all the ways you can hurt someone, before long you end up hurting someone, whether it be them, someone else, or even yourself. It comes out. It doesn't mean that a straight thought or two is horrible and it's going to doom you. We're humans. Our minds do crazy things. We're processing things. But what it means is don't dwell on something you shouldn't be dwelling on. If you dwell on it, your actions will eventually flow from your thoughts. That's how it starts. After that vine snuck up on that bush, it started small. Anybody remember this ad commercial? It's true when you get a bag of chips, right? You can't eat just one. You want more. That vine, when it got on that bush, it wrapped it up one branch, then another, then another. It wrapped up several branches together. It grew and it grew. Again, the sooner it was caught, the easier would have been a stop. I remember doing some research about vines like this. I actually learned something that was really kind of cool, kind of interesting. Would you believe this vine is armed? If you look, right there, that's actually effectively a knife dagger for this, this vine. Now, and they're all over this thing. And that's how it packs into it. Now, daggers will be bad enough. Now, here's something else about it. Turns out those plants are really interesting. And when these daggers are stabbed, stabbed into the other, put that down. Hey, pump some more fluid to me. I'm kind of thirsty. They actually change the behavior of the host plant. Now, on the influence of those message chemicals, it doesn't act the way it normally would. It's changed. When we get all wrapped up in something that we shouldn't, it can change us too. I only listen to a song a few times. I'm not really listening to the lyrics. However, after you do that enough, how do you find that running through your head? Start singing it whenever you don't think about it. it finds a way into our speech and what we write. And that's just a little bit. And what we put in, it comes out. And Jesus says this very well in Matthew 15. If you would turn me to Matthew 15, 17 and 18. Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes in the stomach and is eliminated? Those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. It's not the food you eat that will affect your soul's destination. It's the thoughts. They make it deep down into your heart and come out. Your actions, your words. That's what affects where our soul will end up. Now, plants are interesting. They have ways of times from protecting it themselves. That shade the vine snuck upon usually keeps things from growing up underneath that bush. Lots of sunlight. A particular bush had like a hard hour layer almost like a really thin tree bark. And the branches were, the leaves were slick. It usually keeps things from beating on it. They can also release chemicals in response to a terror attack. So plants are not defenseless. And neither are we as humans, right? We can take actions on our own. 
We can do certain things to take care of ourselves. We can see that trouble coming, and we can step to the side. But even though we can do all that, we still get into some messes that we can't get ourselves out of right. Sometimes it's too much for us. Sometimes it's things that we just can't deal with. Sometimes, like that plant, it needs some help. In the plant's case, I was the gardener. I came to it, I pulled off the vine. For us humans, we've got a gardener too, God, the master gardener. We can call on him when we get in over our heads. For us humans, it's really easy to get in that type of situation. So it's good we've got God on speed dial, can pray to him day or night. We need that sometimes. Now, we spend a lot of time talking about the battle between the, the vine and the plant and the view as a metaphor of sin in our lives. But that's not the whole situation. Let's flip it for a moment. And let's look at it from a different angle. Let's take a moment, instead of thinking that is a struggle to the death, let's try to look at it from the opposite angle. What if we try to see the lessons of this struggle as a struggle for life? Can we learn lessons from the attack of this vine on that bush that can be reversed and used to bring life instead of death? Maybe. Let's start with a recap of what happened. It started with a sneak attack. It started small. It grew bit by bit, more and more until it was overwhelming. The attacker was armed. The attacker, the target of the attack, changed. Didn't act the same way. And sometimes reinforcements had to be called in for help. At the end, it looked healthy. It wasn't really, but it looked that way for a little bit. Now, imagine if instead of wrapping the bush up in a hug of death, if the bush was wrapped up in a hug of life. Imagine if instead of taking from the host, the vine was giving supporting the bush, reinforcing it, strengthening it, encouraging it, feeding it. Flip the script of that attack. Instead of the bush looking deceptively healthy as the violence flourished and was taken from the bush, the bush would have actually been healthy, been stronger, actually make it a better bush. How do we win souls? Do we go and shout them, you're going to hell! Bam! Beat him over the head. Get some help all the time, right? People love that. <laughs> yeah, they run away screaming. You'll never hear from them again. Not the most effective way to do it. Hearts change a little bit at a time. In Scripture reading this morning, it's talking about seeds being sown. Parable of the sower. You spread some seeds here. You spread some seeds there. Some of it takes fruit. It's little bits, those seeds. Another verse, the same injury is used. Turn with me to Mark 4. Mark 4, verse 30. And this is Jesus speaking. Then he said, To what shall we like in the kingdom of God? Or with what parable shall we picture it? It is like a mustard seed, which, when it is sown on the ground, is smaller than all the seeds of earth. But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all herbs and shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air may nest under its shade. A little tiny seed sprouts up into a great tree. It takes time. It takes multiple conversations. Seeing what we do, how we live, how good it is to be loved by God reading for themselves, experiencing God themselves. We don't choose who we'll marry with a single conversation, right? You don't walk up to somebody, say, how you doing, talk for 30 minutes, and go, hey, let's go get married. Doesn't work out that way, does it? It takes time. You got to talk to the person, get to know them, know what they're like, know what they, know what they are. With marriage, it's the rest of your life. With your soul, it's the rest of eternity. It's a much bigger decision. Now, we don't sneak up on people <laughs> like a ninja in the dark. We do things in broad daylight. But like that vine sneaking on the bush, we should start small when approaching new people. 
take things one doubt, one question, one suggestion at a time. And the person can clearly see who God is and how good it is to be loved by God. With our own selves, for our personal things, we can take this own tactic also. We lose our way. We get off course. You start back small. If I'd taken that vine and just ripped it out of that bush, it would have lost a few too many branches. <laughs> it wouldn't have been very good. Now, you cut off the source. You get it at the, the ground. But then you extract it. You work on it. It takes time. It takes effort. Just like in our lives, we have to start small. Either getting to know God or getting to know God again. Studying with one topic. Praying a little more often. Having a few more conversations with God, with His family. Step by step, little by little, we make our way to God. Those habits that we don't want to have, those bad habits, they didn't show up in a flash. They took time to establish. They'll take time to extinguish. The place of good habits. Isaiah, he indicates this. This is Isaiah telling them how they should have learned God's word to the people of Israel. And this is his prescription. Isaiah 28, 9 and 10. Isaiah 28, 9 and 10. Well, sorry. Isaiah 28, 10. For precept must be on precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Here a little, there a little. Now take that concept and expand it out to the community. We're talking about individuals. What about on a bigger scale? This church is that mustard seed that he's talking about. We're the kingdom of God. We can grow this church family person by person, one at a time. We can work with a single person or a small group. Reveal God's love to them. Show them what it's like. Show them to the people who desperately need God's love in this world. Those persons can take in the word of God and be changed. When we need it, we can call for help. On Zoom, in this auditorium, we're surrounded by people who we can call on. It's our family, right? We're all here for each other. And we always should be calling on God whenever we do anything. Because honestly, God is that master gardener. He's the one who seals the deal. Now, as we gain those new souls, like the vine, we wrap them up, right? But not to kill them. We wrap them up with love. That's how we should be doing each other. Somebody's in trouble. Somebody's hurting. Somebody needs help. We do that right now, right? We come to their aid. Check in on them. We see how they're doing. As we gain those new souls, like the vine, we wrap them up. Not to take from them, to support them. Strengthen them. Encourage them. Build them up. Wrap up those new souls with love. We can learn from the wars of plants and how things go down both paths. One path to death, one path to life. When the attack is taken away from, tearing down, weakening, that's the path to sin. Wages of sin is death? Yeah, it really is. After you go down it long enough. When the approach is not an attack, when you're bringing life, love, glory of God, that's the path to life. That's something we all need. Life, not just in this world, but eternal life. Glorious life of God. That's what we're after. That's what we're here for. That love of God is what it's all about. Now, it's been a short, quick lesson about plants. Hopefully it's simple and hopefully it's useful to somebody. I thought it was cool to study the vine. But we'll wrap things up. I'll talk to you about plants enough. If you've been thinking about committing your life to God, if you've taken steps to learn about God, it's time to make that decision. If you'd like to be baptized, if you have anything to bring for the congregation, now's a good time to do it as we stand and we sing. Thank you.